Hi friends, this is John. Welcome back to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. Today, we're flipping the script. I have a very good friend who's been here on the podcast before, James Johnson, who's a cotton grower and, oh well, I shouldn't call him a cotton grower because he grows a number of other crops in, in New Mexico. Uh, James shared some of his story when I had him here and he and I have developed a close friendship over the years. And this episode is our 100th episode of the podcast, and I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to all of my listeners because even though, because of some family stuff, uh, I took a sabbatical from the podcast for about a year, and uh, we've come back now, and we're actually going to be increasing the frequency going forward. But uh, in spite of, when you think about it, this is, I've been doing this now for almost three years or maybe a bit longer than three years. And this is only episode 100. And yet, according to the statistics that we can see, we're one of the most popular regenerative agriculture podcast episode and one of the most popular podcasts in all of agriculture. And so that's a big thank you to all of our listeners and a big thank you to all the guests who've, uh, who've helped make that a reality. So for this episode, uh, episode 100, we're flipping things around rather than uh, me interviewing someone else. James has uh, volunteered to be, or is asked to be here to uh, interview me and get my perspectives on some of the things that, where we've come from, where we're going, and uh, what we see for the future. So thank you, James, for uh, for being here and uh, asking to lead this. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's hard to believe that it was 25 episodes ago. I was a guest on your podcast for episode 75. I think the idea for this this podcast actually happened about a year, or year and a half ago. I, I had a conversation with you about how I had listened to every one of your podcasts, many of them multiple times, and I had actually started listening to other podcasts where they interviewed you and how much I appreciated your story. And I, I remember, I think it was over a year ago, we might have been at the Regen Nexus conference whenever we were talking about you, you actually at, brought up the possibility of of me interviewing you for a podcast. So I'm delighted to be here. I, I, I do count you as one of my best friends. It's incredible the things that we can talk about, and I really look forward to this. So I'm going to kick it off by asking you, you know, the question that you're always asked on other, other podcasts, uh, a little bit about yourself and your history. Yeah, I think many of the listeners, well, actually, I shouldn't assume that many of the listeners of the podcast know my story because... It's a story, you know, you, you repeat it a thousand and one times and you start thinking that everyone knows it when, uh, and you forget that many people may not be familiar with the history. But I grew up on a family fruit and vegetable farm here in Northeast Ohio in the snow belt south of Lake Erie. Um, the climate has changed and is continuing to change. But two decades ago when we were growing, doing intense vegetable production, it was the second cloudiest spot in the Continental 48, second only to Seattle, we had, uh, I forget now, it's like 280 days of cloud cover a year, some ridiculous amount. And 40 inches of rainfall, um, 90 inches of snow, uh, of that coming as snowfall uh, during the winter months. So a fairly humid, wet environment that was a petri dish for propagating diseases. And we used pesticides very intensely. Um, my father started growing vegetables commercially in 1994, and we did that uh, while well, my brothers were still doing that on the farm until just recently. And we had some major challenges. The early 2000s, 2002, 3, and 4, we had three consecutive years in, in which we lost the majority of the crops that we were growing to a number of different diseases and insects that we were not successful in managing with pesticides. And I still remember the third year of that three-year period in 2004, we had this cantaloupe field. Half of it was planted on soil that we had farmed for the past decade that had vegetables every year, cover crops every winter through the, through the winter months and intense pesticide applications all the time. And half the field we had started renting from a neighboring farm that was the first year in vegetable production, previously been in a dairy farm rotation. And so it hadn't had the historical pesticide exposure. That half of the field, we switched the road direction 90 degrees across the former field border. And when the first cantaloupe started ripening, the soil with the previous pesticide exposure had 80% of the leaves infected with powdery mildew. And the soil without the pesticide exposure, 
you couldn't find a single speck of powdered mildew in that entire section of the field. And I suppose that's what you call a light bulb moment, is I, I really wanted to know what the differences are between those two fields. And that's really the story that then led to a lot of studying and research, connecting with many exceptional mentors and learning a lot about plant immune systems and soil biology and plant pathology and learning that the conversation had always been framed that the solution for pests is pesticides. And there was never any conversation, any significant conversation about prevention with cultural management and with nutrition management. And so I had my eyes opened to a very different world of what the possibilities were. And that then led to the founding of Advancing Eco Agriculture in 2006 as a consulting company. And uh, oh my goodness, has it ever been a wild ride since then? Yeah, it has. And, you know, that story, I remember the first time that I heard you in person tell that story, that story resonated with me because we, we had seen similar on our farm here in the, in the desert southwest of, of powdery mildew attack and watermelon. And the first year we grew watermelon, it was easy and we had no powdery mildew, but the more we learned and the more we used, the worse it got. And so that really resonated with me. You know, that's so interesting that how is it possible that I grew up farming in a very humid environment and you are farming in a desert environment and yet we have this parallel experience. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons that I just latched onto you so quickly was because, you know, we were 1500 plus miles apart. And like you said, in two very different climates, dealing with it, exactly the same thing. And I remember you saying that, you know, you coming up and understanding how the, the plant immune system worked. And when you went through that day and started explaining some of those things and me having the aha moment of a lot of what we were dealing with was self-inflicted. So can you talk a little bit more about how you learned how the immune system of the plant work? What I learned in its kind of its most fundamental elements is that immunity, immunity of plants and of people and of livestock, animals, it, it kind of, it's all the same. And in principle, it's all the same. And what it really boils down to is two fundamental principles. And those two are nutritional integrity and microbiome integrity. Like if you want to have a fully functional immune system, you need to have nutritional integrity and microbiome integrity. And we understand that as humans, as individuals, we all have our own individual immune system, but they don't all perform equally well. Some people become ill very readily and others practically never become ill. And the difference is in how well their immune system has been supported, not just during their lifetime, but from even before they were born. And the same concept also holds true of plants. And I found this so intriguing when I first started going down this, uh, this earthworm hole, if you will. I was in my uh, mid to late teens at this point. And there's a, a unique, interesting contextual data point about the environment that I grew up in. So growing up in an Amish community, of course, we don't have television, radio, I only have a, a formal eighth grade education. But we, we read a lot. My parents read a lot and I grew up reading a lot, really enjoying reading. I read several encyclopedia sets from one end to the other while I was going to school, uh, just for fun of it. And the, the local library, uh, our local community library, it's three miles from where I grew up, has the highest per person book lending rate of any library in the nation, not just in the state of Ohio, but in the nation. And I think that's in large part a result of the local Amish community and reading a lot. And so the local library was awesome in that I could ask for any book and they would get it. It might take a while through interlibrary loan, but I got books, I was able to get books. I still remember the incredible experience I had of walking to the library and getting a book from Fritz Albert Pop on biophotonics through interlibrary loan from a library in Germany. And so because of the extraordinary experience of the local library, I was able to access all types of information. And I soon discovered that there were entire journals and dozens of books that had been published in the peer-reviewed literature on plant immune systems. 
And this was a completely foreign concept. I mean, we had, uh, my father was one of the leading growers in the, in the local community. We had consultants out on our farm every couple of weeks throughout the growing season. Uh, we had all kinds of pesticide salesmen and fertilizer salesmen in and out of our driveway all the time. And I had never heard of the concept of plant immune systems. So to discover that there was this entire body of knowledge that was being ignored or that was not being brought into the agriculture space was uh, was quite an awakening experience. And it was fascinating to me to realize that we think about nutrition fundamentally from a perspective of, or historically, kind of the contemporary agriculture of today, thinks about nutrition exclusively from the context of how do you manage nutrition to increase yield? And there's no consideration for immunity, for disease resistance and insect resistance. The APS, uh, the American uh, Phytopathology Association, just published the second edition of Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease, a decade after the first one was published. And the reason for publishing a second edition, like it's very rare to publish a second edition of a scientific book. The reason the second edition was published was because the first edition was the most popular book they have ever printed. So we now have this, this second edition uh, and the first edition, just the title itself, Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease. The fact that those two concepts are becoming associated and in the minds of people in agriculture, that's an incredible, uh, that's a very powerful piece that this, this association is, is entering into kind of the mainstream awareness. And what I expect to happen sometime in the coming decade or so is that there will be a similar book published that will be titled Microbiology and Plant Disease or the Microbiome and Plant Disease and the recognition that mineral attrition is half the equation and the microbiome is the other half of the equation. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, after I started working with Advance in Eco Agriculture, I can remember that that was one of the first books that I was actually encouraged to go buy was that. That's a book that doesn't go back into the bookcase. It's, it's on my desk constantly. So as you did your research and, as, you know, library research is one thing, but as a young man, I know you, you met some interesting mentors and, and people along the way. Do you care to talk about any of those and, and the early days of them and you as a young man and how you were able to communicate with them? I discovered to my surprise that many of the leading scientists around the world are more than happy to talk to people who ask informed questions. And I was able to connect with some some amazing people who really uh, guided my studying and learning and gave me a direction and input uh, and also offered me a lot of advice and perspective on what was happening in our fields. And there are many individuals, um, some that I haven't really named before. And you know, one of my biggest disappointments is the people who have uh, who had such incredible knowledge but who are no longer here. That was actually one of the reasons that stimulated me to start this podcast in the first place. But uh, individuals like Bruce Tainio, who Bruce Tainio was so far ahead of his time, the microbial products that he developed that we now use as microbial inoculants are still to this day, there are dozens of organizations and enterprises, hundreds probably, who are seeking to develop great microbial inoculants and there just aren't very many that can perform to the standard that he developed back in the 80s. Okay, it was, he was 40, 50 years ahead of his time in the development of microbial inoculants and understanding the, the function of the microbiome in developing disease resistance. Bruce had a fascinating story. He was, um, he was a geneticist and a plant breeder for, um, ah, the name of the company is, this is escaping me right now. Uh, everyone would recognize it. It was one of the major uh, seed companies of the day back at that point. And he was breeding spinach for resistance to powdery mildew. And so he developed a strain of spinach that was resistant to powdery mildew. And then a few generations later, along comes a different strain of powdery mildew. And so he develops resistance to strain two, and then to strain three, and then to strain four. And he loved telling the story of, he said, finally, when we got to strain 12, 
I figured out that perhaps developing uh, the idea of developing genetic resistance isn't the pathway that we should be going down. Perhaps there are other factors at play. And that was what really triggered the shift in him. This is going back to the 60s uh, and early 70s when he really started looking at developing uh, microbial inoculants and developing the plant microbiome to develop disease resistance. So there was Bruce Tainio, uh, there was who's now passed away for I think over a decade at this point or yeah thereabouts. Uh, there was Jerry Stoller. Jerry passed away a little while ago. And Jerry was, uh, to the best of my awareness, he was probably the global leader in understanding plant phytohormones and and implementing them effectively in, in agricultural ecosystems. Jerry Bernetti has now passed away as well. And so the good news is that we still have people here with us today who are incredible scientists, who have incredible knowledge. And it would be my desire that the people like Dr. James White and like Gerald Pollack and like Don Huber, that we, we capture as much of their knowledge as we can. Because in the case of Don Huber, for example, he's he's published... I don't know the exact count, but it's over 400 papers in his career. So he's published a lot. But you know, the stories that he has, the examples that he has to share, and the things that he hasn't published are probably an order of magnitude bigger than what he has published. It's just remarkable that the incredible knowledge that is out there, that is in danger of being lost if we don't capture it. So... The early days at AEA, I know you started this on your own, and I know there was a couple of early hires, but tell me a little bit about the the early days of Advance and Eco Ag and how the progression has gotten us to today. Well, it was um... <laughs> it's a wild ride. Um, I started doing uh, Advancing Eco Agriculture was founded in midsummer 2006 as a result of uh, my father also had a local seeds and fertilizer and input supply business for the local region. And the 2005 growing season, we've been doing a lot of learning and studying. We started making some changes on the farm. By 2006, the improvement in our crops was noticeable. It was visually distinct. And so we had, uh, dad had his business and had the customers going back and forth all the time uh, in and out of our driveway and looking at the crops on both sides of our driveway. And they started bringing in leaf samples and bringing in soil samples. And by the middle of that summer, my dad said, look, it's really simple. You can continue to try to be a field manager and help out on our farm, or you can help other people on their farms, but don't try to do both of them at the same time. And... At that point, I had figured out that I really had a love for and a connection to this agronomy work. And so I started advancing eco-agriculture out of that. And so I was still in my late teens at this point, And my dad um, helped me get that started uh, as a part of his existing business. And so when I then uh, came of age at 21, I was starting out with an existing customer base and existing connections, but uh, kind of with, with no resources, no financial backing, no established credit. And uh, it was also, this was about the concurrent timing with when I started realizing that consulting alone was not enough because uh, many times we'd make recommendations for growers that, well, you need to, you need to use molybdenum or you need to use cobalt. And when the need was painfully obvious, it would never get applied because the grower couldn't get access easily to those materials. And that led us to the realization that we need to develop some of these specialty nutritional products. And so in those early days, it was, uh, it was an interesting scramble of uh, getting orders from customers and purchasing raw materials and making the product, shipping it to them, getting it paid and turning around and paying our vendors. It was, uh, it was intense, but I, I was very fortunate. We had a very good team. Jason was a, uh, a foundational part of, of building the organization throughout its history, as was David. And we have a really amazing team of people, but uh, we were able to grow the company organically with no outside funding and, and no outside investment, just simply as a result of being very careful with cash management and uh, just delivering remarkable results and service to the growers that we worked with. So 
Uh, it was only it's only been in the last what is it now roughly two years ago that we brought in investment funding into the company for the first time, and that was you know that was a really valuable it was a valuable business experience, but it was also very valuable I think to have the time because we had we have a very different business case and a very different proposal to our customers that the suggestion and the idea that we can help increase your yields and reduce your pest pressure simply by managing nutrition differently and by looking at different nutrient ratios and nutrient models is a, is a stretch for a lot of people. But taking that time to do that allowed us to, uh, without having a lot of uh, investment shareholders that we needed to set us five, gave us the runway and the time to really establish a lot of experience and establish a lot of credibility. And so it's, uh, I think it was the right pathway for us. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where the future takes us. So I, I've heard stories about the, the old way of, of testing and how, you know, your philosophy has always been not to guess, to do a test. So talk a little bit about the old way of testing and the new way of testing and where the future of that might go. The introduction of that new technology was something that really revolutionized our business at AEA. And that was, I forget when Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease was first published, but uh, there, were, there were precursors to that book and there were a number of white papers that were out there that I was able to organize describing the association of specific diseases with specific nutritional imbalances. And... In the work that we were doing with growers, we were doing dry matter-based tissue analysis, and the frequency varied. On some crops, we were doing it monthly. Some crops, we were doing it every two weeks. Some crops, we were doing it only a couple times a season. And I became quite frustrated because I couldn't get the tissue analysis data to match up with the nutritional profile data that the textbooks suggested should be possible. The disease presence correlating with specific nutritional imbalances just didn't show up in the data very well at all. And so in the winter of 2010, uh, late 2010, early 2011, I was expressing my frustrations with this, this lack of correlation or lack of association. And Arden Anderson suggested that I reach out to a group of consultants in the Netherlands who were pioneering the use of plant sap analysis in a laboratory instead of doing sap analysis in the field. And we experimented with sap analysis in the 2011 growing season. I think we ran about 400 samples that year. 2012, we did more. And by 2013, we started using it on all of our growers across the board. And oh my goodness, did sap analysis resulted in almost completely changing our trace mineral product lineup. Because before that point, when we were using uh, dry matter-based tissue analysis, we would frequently make recommendations for trace mineral sulfates like manganese sulfate or manganese EDTA. Uh, we were using these, these synthetic chelation agents or, or using the trace mineral sulfates because those were the materials that were readily available and they were affordable. And uh, when we applied them and did a tissue analysis test before and after, the needle moved and th we thought that we had fixed the problem. Well, I have some fascinating stories of tomato production in eastern Pennsylvania, where uh, this particular region has calcareous soils. They have more livestock manure than they know what to do with. Their soils have phosphorus levels of four to 500 parts per million, potassium levels of two to 300 parts per million or better, pH is in the range of 7.4 to 8.4. And so you would think that these soils would be highly productive and would produce amazing tomato crops. But the tomato crops consistently suffered from a potassium shortage in spite of soils with ridiculously high potassium levels. And these soils, because of their alkaline pHs and being calcareous, uh, also consistently had uh, showed manganese deficiencies on a tissue analysis. And so we would put on manganese sulfate or manganese EDTA applications and the levels went up on the tissue analysis and we thought we had fixed the problem. Well, when we started using SAP analysis, um, the first two years, 2011 and 2012, we did a lot of parallel testing where we tested samples that were as identical as we could make them and split sampled them with tissue analysis and SAP analysis. And was that ever revealing? Because the SAP analysis showed us that our manganese sulfate applications were doing nothing. 
the needle was not moving on getting manganese into the plant. And that was, that was quite an interesting experience. That led to learning a lot about the specific oxidation state of nutrients and the need to have them chelated. Um, and we had a parallel experience with uh, manganese EDTA to realize that um, in quite a number of products, it's not in the right oxidation state and that it's actually having a detrimental effect on the plant. So anyway, that resulted in really changing our trace mineral product lineup quite significantly. And I think that also our products were widely used and intensely used before that point. But the fact that we had a test that we can take into the field and actually show nutrient movement inside plants as a result of a product being applied or a product being misapplied was powerful because now we could predict disease and insect susceptibility into the future. We could apply products to prevent disease and insect susceptibility or to slow it down. It was a total complete game changer for us. And the only piece that has surprised me is the fact that sap analysis hasn't displaced tissue analysis. And I have a hypothesis about why this is the case. I think far too many enterprises have products that they want to sell more than growers that they want to help. And that when, uh, because there's a number of enterprises out there who've experimented with the use of sap analysis and they use a couple thousand samples and then they stop. And at least a part of the reason for that is because the sap analysis shows that the farmer and the crops don't need the product they're trying to sell or that it doesn't work. And that that's a disappointment to me is that there are these organizations that lack that fundamental integrity, but the technology will reveal all of that in the fullness of time. So that kind of brings me even to the question on macros. I remember the first time, you know, you told us to stop using phosphate fertilizers that we weren't getting our bang for our buck. It was just over application of a lot of product that, that we weren't actually getting anything from. So let's talk a little bit about nitrogen and phosphorus and maybe a little bit of potassium. Um, <laughs> that's quite the can of worms, James. Um, I've given a couple of webinars on nitrogen and nitrogen use efficiency and potassium as well. And I think the, the bottom line summary is kind of shocking. And the, the summary is that when we start working with sap analysis and testing to see what the crop actually needs, uh, speaking broadly, this is across, I mean, AEA today is a team of about 80 people and working in dozens of crops in many different types of environments. And across that whole macro context of experiences, we usually see nitrogen applications drop by 60 to 70% in the first year or two. We see potassium applications drop by 70 to 80% in the first year or two, and phosphorus 40 to 50%, sometimes more. And those are some ridiculously big numbers. And the counterpoint to that is these nutrient applications are dropping and they're staying down for, I mean, we now have some fields and operations that we have a decade plus of experience on they're staying down. The levels on the soil test show that the soil levels are continuing to increase and yields increase immediately and have stayed higher than they ever were. And that's just that's such an interesting perspective is that how can you reduce nutrient applications but yet have yields go up? And it's just an expression of we've been putting on too much of the right thing at the wrong time. So that, that kind of brings me to, I remember again, going back to that first conversation that we had and you, you referred to the, uh, the plant health pyramid and, you know, how did you come up with that? I mean, that's, that's been a, I wouldn't say it a concept, but that's been something that has stayed true for several years now. So talk a little bit about when you first started and, and maybe how the progression of the pyramid came about. You know how things sometimes just happen by a, f a flash of inspiration. After Bruce Tineo passed away, his company used to host an annual conference for their growers and the consultants that they worked with. And uh, after he passed away, they asked me to present at uh, their conference. And I'd say this is roughly 
I'm not sure, maybe 2009, 10, somewhere in there. And uh, for those of you who've seen me in live presentations, I was doing this thing that I so much enjoy is, is no slide deck, no PowerPoint, it's just a marker board. And I'm describing how we have observed hundreds of different fields and operations go through this progression of resistance to different types of insects and different types of diseases at different stages of what was going on within uh, plant physiological development. And I, I start drawing it out on the, on the marker board as a, as a linear progression from left to right, stage one, two, three, and four. And it was, this was all just kind of being in the flow zone, just flowing out of experience, being a channel, if you will, and just putting it all on the board. And it was an incredible one hour presentation. And at the end of that, uh, Arden was in the room. And at the end of that, Arden came up to me and said, uh, you know, your description of the process of what you're describing is exactly how it works in these biological systems. It's a beautiful explanation. And you need to create some type of memorable diagram around this. And um, so that led to the development of the plant health pyramid. And, you know, the plant health pyramid has led to more aha moments than almost any other story that I have told. Because when I share the story of, of the plant health pyramid and how these plants become resistant to different groups of diseases and insects, almost every farmer who's paying attention, who's observing his crops in the field, will say something like, oh yeah, I remember that. I had this experience in this field over here and this explains exactly what was happening, what was going on. And then I had that experience over there. It's just like, it's this repeat story that when, when you get the concepts that are being described in the plant health pyramid, it's like, yeah, this is so obvious. I experienced it. My neighbor experienced it. I just didn't realize what I was seeing at the time. It's almost everyone has that, uh, has that reaction. Yeah. And I remember when I saw that for the first time, and I think I asked you a question about, you know, where you thought most commodity crops or even uh, fruits and vegetables are on that, that are typically grown in a conventional way were. And I think, uh, you know, if you say there's a one, two, three, and four level, I think you referred to it as maybe a minus one or a zero. But talk a little bit about, you know, the, the photosynthetic capacity of plants as we see it today and what you've seen over several years and the advance in eco-ag way of where we can take this crop or any of these crops. Well, I think we can start with a very simple question. How many of us have observed a crop that was completely resistant to diseases? There was no expression of disease of any type. And there was no insect susceptibility of any type. How many of us have experienced that? How many of us have experienced that consistently for repeated growing seasons and repeated in time? There are many growers who have never experienced that once. There are also many growers who've experienced it once or twice, but not consistently. And I think Perhaps the fundamental piece that we have to ask ourselves is what defines health? Like what's the definition of a healthy plant? Because I had this conversation with Arden at one point, uh, or actually he was giving a presentation at an event that I was at. And he was saying that, you know, we, we tend to think of things as polar opposites in black and white. And that it includes thinking about health that way that we think about things are healthy or unhealthy. When in fact, a state of health exists on a spectrum that you can have extreme disease states or you can have optimal health states and that there is a spectrum between those. There is this middle zone. If you have the presence of disease on, let's say, on the left-hand side of the spectrum and optimal health on the right side of the spectrum, there's this large section in the middle that is what he termed the pre-disease state. And... It's in the pre-disease state or in the disease state that far too many people live in today from a health perspective, and also that far too many crops are in. Most of us don't have much context for what a really healthy plant actually looks like anymore. We've never experienced a really healthy plant. And when I say that, 
it's common for some people to have a reaction to say like, oh, what are you talking about? I've grown many healthy crops in my life. I've driven past many healthy fields. I've seen lots of healthy plants. And the reason for the disconnect is because we're not in alignment on the definition of health. And what I'm defining as a really healthy plant is a plant that is completely resistant to disease and insect pests. That's the ultimate expression of vibrant, optimal health. And most of us haven't gotten to see that. So most of us has no context for what that actually looks like. So anyway, I lost sight of your original question. <laughs> no, that was a pretty good, uh, that was a pretty good answer there. So going back to kind of the sap analysis levels, I know that uh, Nova Crop turns the results over to Crop Health Labs, which is a subsidiary, I believe, of, of Advance and Eco Agriculture. And Crop Health has a lot of different ways of presenting that information to growers. We've actually started working a little bit with, um, I know that, that Crop Health Labs has a desired level, but um, you and I have talked in the past a little bit about desired level versus ratio. Is there anything you could comment kind of on what you're starting to see on the, the ratios versus the desired levels? <laughs> Um, we need to schedule a separate two hour interview just to talk about that. <laughs> this conversation can go in so many different directions. Uh, first, uh, once we started gaining some experience with SAP analysis, it soon became clear to us that we need to rethink what defines a, a desired value. Because the way that desired values are defined in many laboratories, not necessarily at Nova crop control, but in many laboratories is, as uh, there are now industry standard values, but also uh, many laboratories use average numbers of their entire data set. So if they've got 5,000 samples of cantaloupe leaves, they just average those together and the average nitrogen, the average potassium levels are what they set as their desired values. And I think that kind of sucks because I don't care to help anyone grow an average crop. I want to help people grow exceptional crops. And the other consideration is that when you start balancing plant nutrition with the expressed intention of balancing nutrition for immune system support, then you start looking at different ratios. All of a sudden, your, your calcium to nitrogen to potassium ratio needs to be different than if it is balanced just exclusively for yield. If you're balancing exclusively for yield, you can get away with less calcium and you're just, you just can expect to apply more fungicide and insecticide applications. But if you want to balance it for immunity and yield at the same time, you have to keep your potassium and nitrogen levels up and you have to increase your calcium levels. I'm just using that as, as a random example. And so it soon became clear to us that uh, we need to reevaluate and reconsider what those desired values are. And they need to be reflective of top performing fields and where top performance is defined as a blend, a combination of both disease and insect resistance and yield and quality, fruit quality, whether that's um, fiber length or storability or protein content, whatever it is that we're, uh, that we're seeking to optimize. And so as a result of that, uh, in our work at AEA, we have, we've developed our own desired values that are different from the desired values of, of Nova crop control because we're looking at additional parameters and we're looking at these things from a slightly different, through a slightly different lens. But then, you know, the, the beauty of SAP analysis is its responsiveness. Like you can see when product applications have been made. You can see when product applications have been missed. You can see when irrigations have been missed. It, it just really shows you what's going on inside the plant to a remarkable degree that just isn't possible with tissue analysis. And once you start seeing these nutrients move around and the way that they relate to each other, it soon becomes extremely obvious, glaringly obvious, that it's not just the desired value itself and it's not just where the levels of a given nutrient are, but the ratios of those nutrients to each other. Uh, we know, for example, the chloride to total nitrogen ratio. If we have at any point in, a, in the season when the chloride levels exceed the total nitrogen levels, 
there's almost a certainty that we will have insect pressure in that crop of some type because insects like aphids and spider mites and and uh, various beetles just love that type of environment. It's it's a plant that is a plant that is particularly stressed. So if you're in an environment that has high chloride levels, then that means necessarily you're going to have to increase your nitrogen to compensate for that. Similarly with potassium and nitrogen, uh, if you have high potassium levels, then you're going to have to consciously, deliberately increase calcium levels in ratio to that to compensate for the different plant physiological expression. So this has resulted in, from a practical management perspective, is that uh, yes, we look at desired levels and the desired levels are important, but if you want to do this accurately and have consistent, reliable results, you also have to consider the nutrient ratios among themselves because different soils and different geological contexts will produce very different nutrient ratios. And I think this is actually an important point that's that's worth expanding on for a bit. Uh, there's all these conversations around nutrient density and producing nutrient-dense food and what defines nutrient density and phytonutrient content and so forth. But I think I'm very much in favor of this conversation in principle and in concept. Like I think we should all aspire to produce the healthiest food that we can and the most nutritious food that we can. But I don't think people fully grasp or realize the tremendous variation that exists in mineral content based on different soil types. When I look at the, our whole data set on tomatoes, for example, where we have tens of thousands of samples, the calcium content variation in sap analysis. Now I understand this is, I'm talking about sap analysis here and not fruit. So it's, it's not a perfect analog, but it's still a valuable, uh, some valuable data points here. Across tens of thousands of samples, the calcium content can vary by a factor of 20 X. That's a huge variation. And that's just one example. I mean, that, that level of variation, uh, uh, having somewhere between a 10x and a 30x variability on nutrient content is common across lots of nutrients and lots of crops. And uh, it's, it's worth pointing out that this is partially an expression of sap analysis uh, and the needle moving very quickly. It, it fluctuates much more than, than a tissue analysis would. And that's its greatest strength. That's that's why, what makes it so valuable. So I think as we develop this conversation, as we start digging deeper into what defines nutritional integrity in a crop and in a plant, and this data starts being revealed, uh, a lot of people are going to be surprised by the significant variation that exists and where that variation comes from. Because, um, yeah, fertilization has a lot to do with it. Soil geology has a lot to do with it, and microbiology has a way more to do with it than most people realize. Yeah, and that question kind of stems from, I've personally tried to assist some growers that are on the, you know, I've had uh, other growers in other areas send me their sap analysis results and ask me, you know, what do you think of this? And there's such a huge difference between what they're seeing in their crop versus what I'm seeing in my crop. Sometimes I scratch my head and even wonder, I mean, the levels are just so different on so many things. And that's what, that's what kind of brought me to the ratio question, because I've seen that in say the Georgia, the Vidalia onion growing area versus my onion growing area, you know, we're high sodium, high potassium, high calcium. They fight each one of those. Like he doesn't have enough sodium. He doesn't have enough, but he has to add potassium and his calcium levels are down but he also doesn't have near the nitrogen needs that I do. So that kind of correlates back to the question and why I asked about ratio. And that just, that kind of takes me to the, you know, you and I have been to multiple different events this year and spoke together and at different times. Let's talk a little bit about the difference in plant health versus soil health and what we kind of see or what you see in your philosophy in the in the definition of what could be regenerative or what should be regenerative in plant versus soil? I think your question, James, is stemming from some of our conversations. Like, I, I think that there is a fundamental misunderstanding of what drives change in agricultural ecosystems or in soil plant ecosystems. And there's this idea that we need to improve soil health and 
when we improve soil health, it's going to bring us all these benefits. It's going to bring uh, better carbon cycling. It's going to bring better water infiltration. It will develop a home for the soil microbial population. We'll be able to grow healthier crops as a result of all of those benefits. And from where I sit, that is a fundamentally backwards perspective. And the question I'd like to ask is, what is the source of new energy? Where's the source you have of new energy coming into agriculture ecosystems? And there's just one source, and that is the sun. Capturing solar energy is the only way you have, or we have, of bringing new energy into an ecosystem. Everything else is just recycling that energy and refining that energy and constantly improving it. And, you know, there is this this narrative, this popular school of thought that I think has really damaged a lot of farms. Uh, well, I don't think so. I know so. And that is the, the idea that uh, the only thing you need to do is improve your soil biology and it's going to fix all of your problems. Just simply correct your bacterial and fungal biomass ratios and everything else is going to take care of itself. And that is such a fallacy. And the fallacy is predicated on the, on the belief, it's based on the belief that biology is the driver of the system. When you, when you, when you think down to like what are the fundamental premises that are underneath that, uh, it's based on the premise that the biology is the driver of the system, but it's not. It's photosynthesis that is the driver of the system. And to really sharpen this point in people's mind, one of the quotes that I've used is that without the contribution of plants, soil is nothing more than decomposed rock particles. Because that's it. It's the process of plants photosynthesizing that sequesters carbon and moves sugars into the soil profile, it moves carbon to the soil profile. And those sugars and that carbon being moved into the soil profile is the fundamental prerequisite for microbial life. Like you can't have bacterial populations without plants. You can't have fungal populations without plants. It's plants and photosynthesis that are the fundamental driver and the engine of this entire process because they are the only channel to bring new energy into the system. And when you think about regeneration, Moving a soil and plant ecosystem from a pre-disease state or from a disease state to a state of optimal health is simply a different way of saying we have to bring lots of new energy into the system. Let's get a lot more energy flow. And that energy flow comes from capturing sunlight. And so when I first started realizing the implications, I mean, they're, they're very obvious when you stop and think about it. I started thinking about studying photosynthesis and I was shocked to discover that what we think of as common and normal is plants that are photosynthesizing somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15% of their inherent photosynthetic efficiency. And the idea that we can have a corn crop that's producing 150 bushel or 200 bushel per acre yield and it's only 10% of what that corn plant is actually capable of is uh, kind of causes you to do a double take, at least it did me. And uh, because what that means is, to me, is that the idea that I got so inspired by is the idea that, well, if we can double photosynthetic efficiency from 10% to 20% or from 15 to 30, then we're likely to get an increased yield response, but it's not likely to be double you might get a 20% or 30% yield response. So where does all the extra sugar go? And the extra sugar that is produced from these healthier plants goes into the root system or out through the root system as it exudates and builds soil microbial populations. It builds stable humic substances. It builds soil organic carbon. And so it was just this fundamental perspective. I think uh, we generally really have got it wrong that we shouldn't be focusing on improving soil health we should be focusing on improving plant health and plant photosynthetic capacity. And when you do that, you can't stop soil health from improving. You can't stop yields from improving. The moment plant health increases, improve soil health and improve yield and improve disease resistance are all 
they're all side effects. They're all benefits that happen as a result of improved photosynthesis. That's the fundamental that drives everything in the entire ecosystem. Yeah, and it it's always been a interesting to me. The more that I've learned, and the more that I've, I, I mean, really, you have you have shown me the way of of trying to understand everything that goes on with all of the crops that I'm growing. And one of the things that takes me back to the nitrogen conversation that we've had multiple times. And, you know, we always talk about soil health and everybody talks about cover crops and building soil carbon, but then they don't follow that up with the, what I would like to say, responsible use of nitrogen behind that and how detrimental of the the wrong application or the wrong timing of nitrogen can be. So, I mean, just highlight a little bit about what you can do with just a poor application timing of nitrogen. This is perhaps an, an overly simplistic way of explaining it. Uh, actually, it's not. It's an accurate way of describing it. There is this uh, idea that uh, nutrients exist in a certain substrate or a certain type of profile in a specific relationship to each other, and that when one of them becomes imbalanced, uh, there is this homeostatic self-regulating where other nutrients will be burned off to come back and to maintain a balance. And there is specific scientific language around this that is escaping my mind right now. Ratan Lal at uh, the Ohio State University has, has done some of this research. Uh, Richard Mulvaney at Illinois University has has uh, contributed to this body of knowledge as well, but the the foundational idea specific to carbon and nitrogen is that in in living soils, and I'm specifically saying in living soils. I'm not talking about dead, long term, hundreds of years of half life humic substances. Although it also applies there, but in the in the fraction of organic matter that is active. And that's actively cycling, which will be the significant majority in most in most agricultural soils. Because this, and we're just aggregating all of this together. We're calling it this this broad blanket term of of soil organic carbon or soil organic matter. But that includes all the living organisms: bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, actinomycetes, fungi, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In that broad aggregate. This living system will always try to maintain carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur homeostasis. And in a balance and in a ratio to each other. And you can use different analytical methodologies and techniques to measure this. But let's just say that for a given analytical methodology, the, the optimal carbon to nitrogen ratio for stable soil organic matter will be in a 20 to 1 ratio. And we know that in living organisms, in bacteria, for example, or in plants or in people, it's generally true that if we want to have uh, the, the sulfur-bearing amino acids, cysteine and I forget the others right now, but the sulfur-bearing amino acids are what are termed stop amino acids. They close out an amino acid sequence in forming complete proteins. So if you want to have a truly healthy protein structure and what are called complete proteins, to have enough of those stop amino acids to form complete proteins requires roughly a 10 to 1 nitrogen to sulfur ratio inside the protein structure itself. So we look at that and we say, okay, we have this bacterial, fungal, nematode, uh, organic material matrix, and we want to maintain a nitrogen to sulfur ratio of roughly 10 to 1, and we want to maintain a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 20 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So now I'm just including three nutrients. We haven't talked about phosphorus yet, uh, and it's not important for us to talk about phosphorus in this context, but so you expand this to include all three of these elements. Now you say, okay, you have 200 parts carbon to 10 parts nitrogen to one part sulfur. And if you want to destabilize that system, then you make sure that it either has excessive or deficient levels of one of those nutrients. And of course, the system responds particularly strongly to sulfur and nitrogen. And so Perhaps I'm, I realize I'm getting into the weeds a little, a little bit here, but 
uh, the easiest way or yeah, one of the easiest ways to destabilize carbon in the soil is to add more nitrogen. So you, you narrow the nitrogen to carbon ratio from instead of being 20 parts carbon to one part nitrogen, you add more nitrogen, let's say down to a 10 to one ratio. And that has the effect of, it's a really interesting effect, it's counterintuitive. You would think that these biological systems would then seek to bring in more carbon to stabilize out the, the surplus nitrogen. But in fact, they do the opposite because the nitrogen stimulates bacterial growth so much that the bacterial populations start um, exhaling. They start consuming a lot of carbon and exhaling a lot of carbon as carbon dioxide. And so when you add nitrogen, there's this interesting phenomenon. You add nitrogen, you actually burn off your soil organic carbon and you, you deplete your microbial populations. You have a long-term net effect of depleting microbial populations and depleting microbial uh, carbon at the same time. There's a fast, if you want to dig deeper into this, there's a fascinating paper by uh, Richard Mulvaney and his colleagues uh, from the University of Illinois who describes this phenomenon, some of the things that they've observed. But it's it's interesting. If you want to deplete soil organic matter, one of the fastest ways to do so is to add nitrogen. It's not tillage. Yeah, and I remember somebody asking a question about fall applied nitrogen and your response to that was, that's the stupidest idea you've ever heard. <laughs> It, it is. It is the stupidest idea that I've ever heard. It is an idea. Fall applications of nitrogen are not for the crop's benefit. They are not for the farmer's benefit. They are not for economic benefit. They are exclusively for the benefit of the folks selling the nitrogen who have application windows that they can apply it in the fall more easily than they can apply it in the spring. That's the only people that it benefits. It doesn't benefit anyone else doesn't benefit the crop. I mean, there, there are no other benefits. There's only downsides for everyone else. Well, and that application of nitrogen and the, the subsequent burn off of CO2 isn't so bad when you have a healthy plant that's there to catch that CO2 and put it back into the soil. But it, it's just ludicrous to think about doing it when there's no growing plant. Well, it's also a question of, of scale and application, a question of degrees. Are you going to apply I'm picking out a number here. Are you going to apply 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, that is somewhat buffered out when you have a green growing plant during the growing season, when you have peak nitrogen demand, or are you going to apply 200 units of nitrogen per acre when there's bare soil and there are no plants to capture it? So yes, there's a question of application timing relative to a growing crop, but there's also a question of application volume. Like the reality is the reason we put on 200 units of nitrogen in the fall is so that we can lose 40% of it and still have enough. Like how stupid is that? So let's talk a little bit about John Kemp, the man. And um, I know you're a, a strong family man. You were raised in the Amish community and go to the Amish church. Let's talk a little bit about your balance. I mean, I've seen multiple times in where people have asked about seeing pictures, you know, why does John Kemp not show his face? So let's talk a little bit about John <laughs> Kemp balancing his strong Amish belief in the fast-paced world of AEA? Well, that's, that's an interesting question, James, because there are a lot of misunderstandings about the Amish community. And so I think it's, it's important to point out that uh, the Amish community is not one homogenous group. There are dozens of different Amish denominations with all varying degrees of use of technology or avoidance of the use of technology and so forth. And I think of it, we, we do have a very strong cultural heritage, but what gives us its strength and its value from my perspective is, is not the fact that we have a certain culture or a certain style of dress and speaking a, another language as our primary language. What really gives it the strength is its, its strong Christian heritage and Christian, uh, Christian foundations from truly trying to live closely, as closely as we can to being true followers of Christ and living by the golden rule and, and using our neighbor as we would like to be treated. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it's been an interesting dynamic as I've, I've traveled a lot outside of the community and I've, I've gotten to uh, gain a perspective, being exposed to the non-Amish community to a much greater degree than, than many are has actually, it's given me even an even greater appreciation for some of the strengths that we have within the community. 
Uh, I see in in society at large. This is this is not so much specific to the farming community, uh, because I think rural America still has kept many of these values. But when we look at society at large, we're really losing our family values. We're losing our community values, and or at least it appears that way to me from from my perspective. And uh, as a part of the community values. Uh, there is there's this value of respecting the desires of others in your community, even though you're not necessarily, uh, don't necessarily agree or think it's the right choice. It's a part of being together in a, in a collaborative uh, environment and culture. And so, yeah, there are, there are many people who wonder why my face doesn't show up anywhere. And it's, it's not, something that I personally have a problem with, but within our community, it is considered an interpretation of, I think it's the second commandment that you shall not have any graven images. And it's interpretation semantics. We could have a whole different conversation around that. But out of the desires of the community and my respect for the community and my respect for a brotherhood that works together, I choose to not have my face out there, even though I travel a lot and, and use a lot of technology. That's that's just one expression of that that I seek to uphold. Yeah, I know the travel at times has been a little bit difficult. I, you know, I know you don't drive, so someone drives you. Usually if you're traveling, you hire a driver, and, and I've seen that, and I've actually had the pleasure of driving you to the airport. So that's that's got to be a little bit different than what you deal with in the rural community, especially whenever you work with so many people that are so far away from airports and, and places like that. Well, and it's it's also just like driving across the entire country. You know, uh, was it was it last summer or the summer before that my family and I were, were at your place and we just uh, hire a driver in a vehicle and uh, took a four week trip across the entire country from coast to coast pretty much. Yeah, that was fantastic and a great visit. So let's talk a little bit about, I know we hit upon the past of AEA. You talked a little bit about the current. I know that you just crossed a big threshold by opening a new facility in Colorado, a new production facility. Let's talk about kind of the current things, and then we'll we'll transition that into the future of AEA and where you think that it's going. Well, AEA is just simply an amazing organization, and it's really a credit, not so much to me. If I deserve any credit at all, it's simply in being able to uh, attract and to surround myself with really great people, because it is really the team that makes AEA as an incredible of an organization as it is. So uh, we have a team of 80 people today who absolutely are inspired and love the work that they do. They love working with each other. You know, we have, uh, we have, <laughs> we, we got this one uh, anonymous, we, we conduct these um, anonymous employee feedback surveys regularly to, to see what improvements we can make and how we can improve as an organization. And we got some negative feedback a while ago that said something to the effect of the one significant downside of working at AEA is that 40 hours a week go by before I even realize what happened. And you can easily put in way more time at work than you really should because it's so much fun working with your colleagues. <laughs> and if that isn't the perfect type of, of work culture problem to have, I don't know what is. So today we're on uh, several million acres of, of farmland on about 55 different crops, mostly here in North America. We're starting to do quite a bit of work in South America and more international work as well in Australia and in Europe. Uh, different parts of Europe, Eastern Europe as well. And there are a number of changes that are going to occur over the coming year or two, changes in some of our business model. You know, when I started advancing eco-agriculture, initially we were a consulting company only. And then we shifted to paying our bills with the use of, based on product sales of these specialty nutritional products and uh, microbiome inoculants and so forth. And partially because that was... That was the business model that people understood at the time. And over the years, we've been asked to do consulting, uh, disassociated from those products on, on several occasions. And uh, we have done some of that, but it wasn't, we weren't really set up for that. And this, it was interesting because, well, you're a customer of ours, you've experienced it. Our approach when working with a farm 
still embodies that deep consulting approach. Like it's, it, there is such deep, comprehensive and thorough systems-based consulting. And then the products are kind of a, a tag along stepchild at the end, even today in, in how we approach our relationships with growers. But uh, there are still organizations that desire the consulting that's disassociated from products, the benefit of an independent third party perspective, if you will. And so that is something that we're going to be announcing here in the coming weeks and months. Uh, we're, we are already doing some of this, particularly our international work, uh, where it's not as easy to get products uh, into foreign countries. Uh, increasingly, we're doing more and more consulting work. Uh, so that's a piece that is growing on the AEA team. But then when I look at the AEA of the recent past has been thought of as being a specialty plant nutrition and, and products company with uh, the consulting associated with it. And that's not going to be the advancing eco-agriculture of the future. Uh, it's, it's already begun to shift. I, I don't know how much uh, you've personally seen already, but for the last several years, we have been developing this this suite of technology tools for the use of our team internally in-house to help all of us be more effective and to be more efficient uh, with the administrative side. And with having had the depth of experience that we've had with SAP analysis and now some of the new sensors that are emerging with the ability to uh, measure nutrient profiles in the field and the ability to measure microbiome profiles in the field very inexpensively, kind of the next step that is going to be released, and I'm not going to put a timeline on this, I can say that uh, beta versions of this technology are already being used inside AEA. But at some point in the future, there's going to be a public release of technology tools that are agronomy recommendations engines, where people can put in their information, their, their soil analysis, sap analysis data, whatever uh, type of data they have access to, their crops, disease susceptibility, and so forth. And the recommendations engines will be able to make recommendations for what types of soil amendments to apply, what types of fertilizers or nutritional supplements to apply with a thoroughly backed up and explained rationale for every recommendation and also be able to predict disease and insect susceptibility into the future. So that technology is, is coming. We are actively working on it inside AEA right now. And it's, I think that what I envision for the future is that technology component is probably going to become a much bigger enterprise than the existing AEA enterprise, but it wouldn't have been possible without all the knowledge and the experience, and the know-how that has been developed and continues to be developed as a result of the deep consulting business. Yeah, it's interesting with the with the hundreds of thousands of data points that you have now. How you you know AI can help to start understanding those and the and where the future may lie with an AI type of product. I also know that you hired a new chief science officer, Dr. Laura Cavanaugh. You want to talk a little bit about what she's been working on and some of the some of the cool things that's coming down the pipe. Yeah, I, I actually need to have her here on the podcast at some point to talk about uh, her work. I think the simple way of describing it is I described some of our experiences with SAP analysis. When we shifted from tissue analysis to SAP analysis, that triggered a revolution in our approach to plant nutrition because we had so much better data. You know, there's this this quote, I forget who it's attributed to, but the only thing worse than no data is bad data. And with tissue analysis, I'm now convinced we were relying on bad data. We were getting bad information. And we're kind of in a, in a similar situation, although it's, it's growing and evolving a lot with biomakers and some of the uh, genomics testing uh, technologies that are now available. And agronomy has been defined for the last couple of decades or century almost in terms of chemistry, because that's what we were readily able to measure. We weren't readily able to measure the microbiology. And uh, the technology that Laura is bringing to the table is the ability to measure a complete genomics profile, a complete DNA profile of all the organisms that are associated with a plant in the rhizosphere or in the plant leaf surface or uh, within the plant leaf in a matter of minutes 
for a very affordable cost. The cost fluctuates and depends on scale of how many dozens or hundreds of samples you're running at once. But if you're running a hundred samples at once, then the cost might be 30 or 40 bucks a sample in terms of the actual material costs to run a test. Like this, I'm kind of speaking prematurely here because I don't know exactly what uh, the costs are going to turn out to be. But at that point, to be able to sequence a full soil microbiome and compare against a database of over 6 million different organisms and identify exactly what is there and the proportion that they are there, the ratios between these different species, is, um, I suspect, also going to lead to a whole bunch of different breakthroughs. Imagine pulling that type of data every two weeks of the growing season, exactly like we do with a SAP analysis, in parallel with a SAP analysis, and then comparing those two. What are we going to discover about the association of specific microbial populations and microbial groups with the absorption of certain minerals. Like all of a sudden, we're going to be able to manage biology in a way that is more similar or beginning to approach the way that we manage plant nutrition today. And that's that's never been possible before. And it is, uh, in many ways, it's a new frontier. We have no idea what it is that we're going to discover because we now have data processing tools uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and the ability to look at large data sets and learn things and describe correlations that we haven't been able to look at before because it's just you develop data overwhelm from trying to look at it manually. Yeah, that uh, that intuition that you built with the team over years is going to be a big integral part of that too. And absolutely understanding why that intuition was there or understanding what the consultant might have seen. So, you know, the only thing that we can do is be better than we were yesterday. So let's talk a little bit about products and potential. I may be getting in trouble with the team or with <laughs> with product development and, and asking this question, but is there any glimpses into the future of what AEA is, is working on now and what uh, new product development might look like? Oh my goodness, James, you really are going to get in trouble and I'm going to give you all of the credit for that. Like I, I'm completely irresponsible in this. No, I'm joking, of course, but um, I will talk about it a little bit. You know, a decade ago, actually uh, 15 years ago, I was just starting out. I was doing all, all types of really innovative product research with a specific eye towards developing what today are called the biocontrols and identifying the active ingredients, whether those are minerals or whether they are plant extracts or whether they're specific groups and associations of microorganisms that have a very marked effect on reducing resistance to diseases and in insects or even actually suppressing or killing diseases and in insects that are already present. And we have, for any number of reasons, we haven't developed that technology at AEA over the last decade. Uh, a lot of that technology was developed to the point of proving effectiveness in the field. And then it's just sat on the shelf uh, since that point. And, and a part of that is uh, a result of the lack of funding. Like if, if you want to develop a product that is an effective biocontrol uh, and get a pesticide registration for it, then pesticide registrations and so forth require uh, significant funding that we haven't had access to up to this point. Uh, there's a lot of research, a lot of validation that's required. And so as a result, we have, I'm not exaggerating, James, we have dozens of technologies like this that have been sitting on the shelf for a decade and a half. And uh, there was a sense when, when we first started down this pathway, like the specialty plant nutrition products and the microbial inoculants that we developed when we started this back in the early 2000s, uh, it's not accurate to say that there was no one around because there were other companies around that were thinking similarly and doing some similar things. But there were very few. It was There were so few that Gary Zimmer used to razz me and call uh, the the approach that we were doing uh, fish, etc. And he, he would elaborate on that and say all of the organic or all the liquid biological friendly products that were available on the marketplace were liquid fish, humic substances, and seaweed. And he wasn't too far from being wrong. There, there wasn't nearly the selection that is available today. And so the products that we developed at the time were, they were a, a decade ahead of their time at least. 
in terms of some of the innovative technologies that we that we put into them. But you know, time goes on and uh, other people seek to emulate success. And we have had lots of imitators in the space and the, the product landscape has really changed significantly. And so I think it's time for us as an organization to make that, that next leap forward and develop this, this next set of products that we, uh, as of right now, the way our products are framed right now, we can't legally call them biostimulants and we can't legally call them biocontrols. We can't even have that conversation from a regulatory perspective. And uh, so there's there are some investments to be made there. But then also, uh, not just from a biocontrols and biostimulants perspective, but we also have uh, some very innovative plant nutrition technology that's been sitting on the shelf for entirely too long. And I'm really excited. There are, I think, four, if I'm not mistaken, I think there are four products that have been in the pipeline for a couple of years that are all uh, slated to be launched and released here in, in the next uh, couple of weeks and months. So it's going to be a pretty exciting spring for us with, with some of the new tools that we have available. I'll just give you one, one quick example. We have one of our most impactful products. I'm hesitant to call it that because we have so many products that just really kind of knock people's socks off. But one of our most widely used products is this, what seems to us to be this relatively simple little microbial inoculant called BioCoat Gold as a seed treatment. And I call it simple because it, it appears that way in the package, but BioCoat Gold is anything but simple. It's this, this synergistic stack of nutrients and biology, microbial inoculants, and can't call them biostimulants, but things that accelerate the development of those microbes and of plants. It's, it's this whole combination of uh, bacterial inoculants, fungal inoculants, and so forth that um, produce some really exciting benefits in plants. But there is this, this analog, this kind of this parallel technology of mineral seed treatments. So instead of microbial seed treatments, a mineral seed treatment. And we've produced some fascinating results going back um, at least four or five years ago by using some of these, these trace minerals uh, like zinc and manganese and copper and cobalt and so forth in very concentrated form, but dilute applications, putting on something like a couple of quarts of these trace mineral concentrates on a, onto a ton of seed and getting some remarkable responses in terms of seed germination and vigor and rapid photosynthesis and microbial colonization as a result of more sugar production. Just a lot of good things that are happening. So that is one new product that is going to be released in the, in the coming months. And you know, we have this constant, it's not a debate, but this recurring conversation inside our team at AEA we have a handful of products, as, as many companies, I'm sure that's true of many companies, we have a handful of products that, it's, it's the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. We have 80% of our revenue coming from a handful of products. And so there's a, a school of thought of driving efficiency to say, well, you should just trim out and prune out everything else and just focus on these things that perform so remarkably well and just go out and get them on as many acres as possible. But the other perspective, and the one that we're based our entire premise on as a company, is that we have to look at this as an integrated system. And that when a crop is deficient in cobalt and requires cobalt, it doesn't matter how much copper you apply or how much boron you apply, if you don't fix the cobalt problem, you're going to have the whole system is not going to be performing at its optimal efficiency. And so as a result of that, we have quite a number of our products in, in our lineup that aren't widely used and they don't need to be widely used, but when they are needed, there is no replacement for them. And I think that's uh, one expression of what we're seeking to, to build that out and to expand uh, some of these more niche use cases like a seed treatment, but they're going to be so valuable for growers because of the significant impact that those very tiny applications can have. Yeah, a good example of that on my own operation is, you know, we go through a, at least a truckload of Sea Shield a year and rejuvenate is probably close to three quarters of a truckload. But I bought a, a full 275 gallon shuttle 
of cobalt at the beginning of the year. And I think I'm still sitting on about 125 gallons of it. But that is one of the most important things that we've found here that we can apply. And there's hardly or rarely a foliar application on my own farm that's something like that, or even copper. You know, we use a lot more copper than we did, say, three or four years ago, starting to understand the importance of these different micronutrients. So I, I see what you're saying. I don't buy very much of them. You know, we're, we're applying quarts of other products, quarts of Holocal and half a gallon at times of, of rejuvenate or a gallon of rejuvenate, but we might be applying four ounces of cobalt. So it doesn't take a lot, but it's huge in that. So taking a page out of the John Kemp playbook, I'm going to ask you a question that you ask almost every one of your guests. What is one question you wish I would have asked? <laughs> oh, now I turned about as fair play, huh? Actually, I uh, I did ask that question quite a bit in the in the early on. You know, I, I listened back to the beginning of the podcast, and you have to remember the context. I grew up in this very protected community, and uh, with an eighth grade formal education. And also, my personality it was very. Um, I'm actually naturally quite introverted uh, or more on that end of the spectrum. And so putting myself out there in, in a podcast uh, and interviewing someone felt very vulnerable and very scary. And I think if you go back and listen to some of the earlier episodes compared to some of the later episodes, there's been quite an evolution in my level of comfort um, sitting behind a microphone. And so I don't ask that question nearly as often anymore as, as I used to. But I think, what's the question I wish you would have asked? Um, I wish you would have asked me a bit more about the Amish culture and what defines it and how I bring that to work, how I bring that to my professional work. Because, you know, I, I look at the, the family values and the community values and what it really means to be a true brotherhood and the way that we interact with each other. And there are a few pieces that have really stood out to me. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention two of them. The first is the golden rule and how it's so frequently misunderstood. And the second is how we are to interact with people who offend us. So when we think about the golden rule, I, I've asked this question of people many times is, don't recite the golden rule to me, but tell me what it means in the simplest terms possible. Explain it to me as if though I were six. And the most common response is, if you don't want someone to do bad things to you, then you don't do bad things to other people. But that's in fact not at all what the golden rule says and what it's about. That particular framing of the golden rule is, is a negative framing and it's a passive framing. Don't do things to other people. Uh, like You can lock yourself in a room and can be completely isolated from all of society and comply with that version of the golden rule. But what the golden rule actually says is both active and positive. It says, do the things to other people that you would desire for other people to do to you. You can't obey that version of the golden rule when you're isolated from everyone else. Like it requires you to reach out to people, to be proactive, to be interactive. And I think that's, a piece that has been very interesting for me is to try to really live by that. And that meshes very well with this, this second piece. Uh, when I think about how I would like to be treated, there's this phenomena in popular culture today. Like, it's certainly, there's an element of this within the Amish community, but it's much less pronounced. The, our culture tends to be fairly outspoken and direct and candid uh, and very straightforward communicators culturally, at least much more so than, than mainstream society, I would say. And so it's, it's just been a, a more recent growing awareness that this phrase that's called passive aggressive still contains the word aggressive, that there is still an element of aggression in being passive. And so much of what we call aggressive behavior, behavior or anger, or whatever word we want to use, stems from being offended. 
It's like we are offended about something. And so we lose respect for someone or whatever the it is, whatever it is we're offended about. The mainstream culture, as as I perceive it, is that uh, we very seldom address that directly. We don't address it right up front. And I'm not talking about directly as in that moment in time, although that's sometimes appropriate. But uh, we avoid the issue. We skirt around it. We don't we don't address it in a head-on fashion. And it's not always necessary to do that if, if we don't have close relationships with people. But if it's someone that we spend a lot of time with, a colleague at work, someone in our family, extended family, or in a brotherhood community, then for the benefit of long-term relationships, it's imperative that we address it and that we address it up front. And so there is this couple of verses in Matthew 18, and I'm used to reading this in German, so I'll paraphrase it into English as best I'm able. It says something to the effect that if a brother offends you, you are to go to him and address it between the two of you alone and try to resolve it. And if you're unsuccessful, you are then to take one or two other people with you and go again and try to resolve it again. And if you're still unsuccessful, at that point, you bring it to the entire church. And of course, this is speaking in a spiritual and church context, but the reality is that this is equally relevant in a work context or in, in a family context. It doesn't matter the context. It's, it's still a relevant process. And I believe that if we followed that process consistently and reliably, it would resolve so many issues like the most, the most beautiful relationships that I've ever experienced, the most beautiful interactions always occur on the other side of those seemingly difficult conversations. And giving them additional time and letting things fester and not addressing those things that we're offended by is the worst thing that you could do because the easiest way to grow a molehill into a mountain is to give it time and to allow it to fester. And so... The way that I desire to be treated is that if I unwittingly offend someone, I desire for that to be brought to my attention immediately. And I communicate that constantly to our team at AEA and to my family. And I also try to live by that example that when things come up that concern me uh, or that I wish were different, I do not hesitate to bring it forward and to to try to and seek reconciliation and try to resolve whatever differences there might be, differences of perspective or opinion or whatever the case. And, you know, recently I had, uh, we had just had a new executive assistant join our team, which I, uh, she's been a godsend, a tremendous relief in just the, the sheer volume of stuff that's going on in my life on a day-to-day -day basis. And when she was coming on board and uh, we started working together, she asked me the question, like, what is what is my uh, style of communication and feedback and giving her feedback if, if she does something different from the way that I would wish it to be done? And I told her that you can depend on uh, my usual style of feedback is if I see something that I wish were different, it will take you about 90 seconds to know about it. It's right now, immediate, in a, in a kind and loving way. It doesn't have to be confrontation or anything else, but it's just immediate attention, immediate attention resolution and move on. And you know, that prevents so much potential conflict. There is this Japanese phrase, permit nothing to disturb your peace. And that can mean different things. It can mean having such a deep level of inner peace that things that happen around you don't ruffle your feathers. It can mean removing the things from your life that you find consistently annoying. Or it can mean when things come up, you just address them immediately and move on. And so I think those are the, the elements that I've tried to bring to our culture and our work environment at AEA and the way that I interact with people. And you know, it's the energy that you put out into the world is exactly the way that the world responds. So because I would desire to be treated this way, to be honest and straightforward with people, and I put that out into the world, that's exactly the energy that I get back. And it just, it creates frictionless relationships. It creates frictionless uh, business communication. Like it's, if I can tell a potential partner exactly what it is that we're looking for and exactly what it is that we're trying to avoid, we can reduce 
negotiations from a protracted process of weeks or months down to hours or days. And that is that's such a beautiful way to go through life. And I'm really grateful for that. Well, and it's it's really interesting, you know, being a four-year customer of AEA and working with so many different uh, facets of the team and seeing the culture that you have built and the the integrity that you have built within the company. You know, sales are important, but they're not everything. I love the fact that uh, you have salaried employees, not commissioned employees. I've dealt too long with with employees of other uh, distributors that were driven by, you know, making some big sale so that they can get a bonus. And I really appreciate that that the employees of AEA have this integrity of always do the right thing and always do what's right for the grower. And that's that's been the biggest and most astounding thing that I've that I've learned of the company and and one of the reasons that I trust the company so much and I trust the team so much. Well, that's quite a compliment. Thank you, James. Well, James, I uh, I want to be considerate of your time. I know we're running up on the uh, the time for both of us. So I want to say thank you for being here and for being gracious enough to host this. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I appreciate our friendship and relationship, and uh, I look forward to having lots more fun conversations with you. Absolutely. I look forward to the future and seeing what this uh, big adventure holds for all of us, myself as a grower and, and you as the founder and the chief vision officer of, of Advance and Eco Agriculture. So it's been my pleasure to interview you and kind of be the semi or quasi host of the Regenerative Agriculture podcast for this. And I, I'm quite honored. So thank you, John. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening and we look forward to working with you.